Hi everybody, my name is Jason. I'm Caden. I'm Jaden. I'm Eli. And we are the Yahoo and the Torah channel. We thank you guys very, very much for hanging out with us. It is a second day on our creator's calendar. <clears throat> and we hope you guys are having a wonderful day. It's the beginning of the work week for most of you guys out there. We hope that you have a wonderful week. And we hope that you are keeping the Torah in your heart, mind, and soul. And you have Messiah Yahushua. For those who do not know who Messiah Yahushua is, he was born Yeshua. His, he came out as he's now named Yahushua. Yeshua means salvation. There were no J's in the, in the Hebrew language. People are like, well, it doesn't matter. That's just what the name was translated as. That's not, names don't translate. My name Jason is still Jason down in South America. It never, ever changed. Although people can't really say it. They say Yason, but my name has never changed. And so um, it doesn't translate. And so those arguments that names will translate like this, they, they don't. And when you say, hey, Zeus, or you're saying the son of Zeus, that was the whole gig. And prior to that, it was Isis, right? And it's like Isis. And so they, they've, they've messed the name of our Messiah up and they've messed the name of our creator up. Most call him God. He has a name. I am that I am. And it's Yahuwah. And he's Jodhead, Vodhead. And this is our story. Here we go. Okay. So we are into chapter. This is, um, what chapter are we on here? 14. 14. 14 verse 31 is where we are at. Okay. A rich man standing by said, we cannot understand these things and they confuse us. Just tell us what we must do to enjoy eternal life. Yahushua said, by your attire, you are among those privileged to enjoy wealth. What do you do with it? The man replied, I do as others, getting the most out of it and enjoying life in full. Yahushua said, you would be better off selling all you possess and giving the proceeds to the poor. Only thus can you discover yourself and benefit from eternal life. The rich man's companion said, wise teacher, what of me? I conform to every verse of the Torah. I pray every day and give generously to the poor. Yahushua said, have you ever been hungry or slept on the street or gone unclothed? The man said, no, why should I? Yahushua said, you deceive yourself and are a hypocrite. Besides, how can you say you comply with the Torah and teachings of the prophets? Is it not stated in the Torah that you should love your neighbor as yourself? Yet all, all about you, there are people who are hungry, clothed in rags, and homeless. Your house is filled with good things, far exceeding your moderate needs. And all you hound out are a few coins and a morsel of food. It is the duty and obligation of such as you see. No man suffers hunger and privation in your neighborhood. All right, Kate, what do you make of this? Well, basically, it says that you don't need more than basically what you need to live on. You need your maybe your rent money, your food money, whatever you need for your family. But the extra stuff you should be helping others out with. You don't need to be rich. You don't need to be the giant rich person that has all the money keeping it for yourself because you're not, you're not going to be able to take it with you when you go. Yeah, and, and he's qualifying people who this guy thought he was good, right? He thought he did all this kind of stuff. But the qualifications that he they put are, have you ever been hungry? Have you ever been unclothed? And the guy had no answers for it. He's like, why, no, why should I? Well, um, you know, that is what the basis of the Torah is, is that we are supposed to help those who are unable to help themselves. And so, yeah, great stuff. 39. Turning to a disciple, sitting at his side, Yahushua said, Shimon, son of Jonah, let this be your teaching. It is easier for a camel to enter into the city by the needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the glory of heaven. The rich man turned away and left. Now, this translation is far better than the king's, right? The king, nobody has any idea what it is talking about. Um, here it clearly says, entering into the city by the, the needle's eye. That is what this little tiny thing is called. It's called, it's called the, the eye of the needle. And it's a little tiny doorway that you're not going to be getting a really a camel through unless the camel can get on his knees and like walk through this thing unloaded. It's, it's essentially what he's say, saying. And that was what there, there is that eye of the needle in Jerusalem. So what he's talking about, and, and some of them, like the suffer screwed up the translation. And he said it's easier to, for a rope to go through the eye of a needle. But that is not what Messiah said. That was more bad translations by Dr. Stephen Pigeon. Okay, 40. And another who was there said, Master, just what is meant by my neighbor? Yahushua then told this parable. A man had found it necessary to travel the road to Jericho, going out from Jerusalem. Along the way, he was attacked by footpads who stripped him naked, beat him up, and after taking all he possessed, left him half dead by the roadside. A short time later, a priest came along, along the same road and seeing the injured man lying there, passed by on the other side for fear, defilement. Another self-righteous man came along but hastened by thinking, I would help if I could, but he is nearly dead and I have no physician. Better for me to push on and tell someone. 
A merchant came by, but seeing the man lying there, thought, perhaps the robbers are still around and I should not dismount. Besides, I wear fine clothes, which would be spoiled. Now, a lonely Samaritan, traveling the same road, came upon the man lying there, and his heart was moved with pity. So he stort, tore strips off his tunic and bound the injured man's wounds. Then lifting the man, he set him on his own donkey, bringing him to an inn and attending to his needs. When departing the next morning, he said to the innkeeper, Here is some silver. Look after this man, and if the payment is sufficient, I will settle the bill on my way back. Which of these four, in your opinion, acted as a neighbor towards the helpless man? All right. This is the story of the Good Samaritan. Yeah. We've heard this before. Uh, you're supposed to help people. You know, it doesn't matter if you have good clothes on. It doesn't matter if you want to be unclean. You know, because guy has blood on him. You got to help the guy, right? He needs help. If not, he might die. And then you might have a hand in that because you didn't help him. And you could have saved a life. But instead, he died because you walked away from him. Now, let's say somebody is alongside the road with a help me sign. Is there an opportunity for people to be Good Samaritans? I would say yes. Absolutely. Every single person you see. Every single person that is sitting alongside the road with a homeless sign or somebody that lives in a tent on the side of the road. And North America, unfortunately, has turned into a fourth world country. And many of the big cities, they're lined. The streets are lined with homeless. Homeless unlike anything we've ever seen. Now, we live in what people call a third world country. And there are homeless people, but there's nothing like in the States. You don't see people in tents like lined up in the streets in the cities. And um, yes, there are homeless people, but it is, it is getting very, very bad, bad in North America. And so there are a tremendous amount of times. And even if you don't have a dime to give these guys, why don't you sit down with them, give them a hug, teach them about Messiah, teach them about the commands of our creator, ask them how they got there, how, where are you going, right? Talk to these people. These people are not monsters. These people are down on their luck. These people are at the worst that they'll probably ever be if they don't have a home. And your opportunity is right there. Every single person you walk by is an opportunity to be the Good Samaritan. When you walk by them and you see them with a help wanted sign and you do nothing, you have done exactly what the rest of these people have done. That's, that's the bottom line. 44. Yahushua said, uh, actually 43, the, the man who questioned Yahushua said, why, surely the man who took compassion on the stricken man, and he's answering Messiah's um, oh, question, question of, right. of who's, who's, the, who's the most compassionate. 44. Yahushua said, now you know your neighbor. Go and act likewise towards men. Leaving that place, Yahushua and those with him went by boat to another shore on the Sea of Galilee. Arriving on the morning of the Shabbat, as Yahushua was going into the place of worship, a woman bent, double, without the ability to straighten herself, came and begged Yahushua to heal her. He put one hand under her chin and the other on her back and straightened her up. She was always filled with happiness. All right, hold on real quick. The Levite who conducted the worship noticed this and seeing the woman's side said to her, six days are set aside for work. But the Shabbat is sacred, and you should not have sought healing on that day. Yahushua, overhearing this, waited outside for the Levite, and when he came, what and came said, "What a hypocrite you are! What member of your flock does not loose his cattle or donkey from their stalls and water them on the Shabbat? Also, are the cows not milked and the hogs fed? They are not left to suffer. Yet you could deny relief to this poor woman because it is the Shabbat." All right, what are you going to make of this? Um, we're supposed to do good on the Shabbat, we're supposed to help on the Shabbat, we've gone over this before, how the people are like, hey, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't be killing on Shabbat, you shouldn't but these people are already, already like, taking their cows out, doing other stuff, like, they're doing much more work than, you know, what is doing. He gave an example that he asked if the hogs are fed. Do Torah keepers keep hogs? No. Uh, would there be, I mean, is it, it, just, is it, would it be against the Torah to keep a pig? No. No. And we can have a pig, we just, uh, they're trash can. Probably, they're, they're, they probably use them for cleanup. Most people, most people that are there aren't going to have pigs, I don't think. They're not even... What would be, I mean, the pig would be a cleanup crew, right? right? So you'd have a pig for certain reasons, but you wouldn't have a pig to eat it because a pig is not food. Um, Leviticus 11 clearly tells us the food dietary guidelines, and pig is not that. All right, so we've heard this, we've heard this before, and it, Messiah clearly changes it up a little bit here and tells us a little more qualifications on you know healing on the Shabbat. And, you know, this is, these are things that we've talked about before because we have cows. We have to feed the cows. We have to do all that stuff. If we don't feed them on Shabbat, then the cows and things suffer. Um, let's continue on. 48. 
Hearing this, many of the people supported Yahushua, and he preached to them. And a, and a blind man was brought to Yahushua while he preached. He took the blind man apart from the crowd and moistening his thumbs, drew them across the blind man's eyes. The man gave a sudden cry and squinched up his eyes. But Yahushua said, open your eyes and tell me what you see. The man did so and said, I could just tell it is light, but cannot distinguish anything. Yahushua then covered the man's eyes with his hands and after withdrawing them said, what do you see now? The man replied, oh, master, I can see everything, though it is not steady. Sometime later, the apostles who had been away rejoiced, rejoined Yahushua, bringing with them a disciple who had deserted Yahushua in Endor. His name was Barnabas. And seeing him, Yahushua was overcome with joy and welcomed him warmly, whereupon two of those who had come with him went aside and were stolen, for they had not been received in this manner. Calling the 22 men who were with him, Yahushua addressed them as follows. A man had two sons, and one day the youngest came to him and said, Father, I want to go away from here. Therefore, give me the inheritance, which would one day be mine, so I can take it with me. So the father divided his estate and gave the youngest son his portion. This was then sold, and the youngest son departed to a distant city where he dissipated the money on women and riotous living. After his money had gone, he found that no one wanted to know him, and soon he was completely destitute. No work being available for him in the city, he went outside. But the only job he could obtain was that of a swineherd. Often when he saw the pigs gorging themselves, his, stomach, his own stomach aching with hunger, he would think, if only I could bring myself to eat the pig's swill, it would ease my hunger. What a fool I have been, for here I am worse off than any of my father's employees. I will go back to him, admitting my failure as a son, for he never withheld anything from me and let me go my own way when this was what I wanted. So he set off and returned to his father's estate. His father saw him coming while he was still far off, and seeing his son foot sore and weary, his father's heart was filled with compassion. He ran out to meet him and embraced him warmly. The son was stricken with remorse and said, Father, I have done wrong, but will do my best to make amends. I am unworthy to be treated as a son, but let me work for you as a servant. But the father led him home and called out to the servants, Here is my son. Bring him a change of clothing. Get a ring for his hand and sandals for his feet. Go and kill the fattening calf and roast it for we are going to celebrate his return with a feast. I thought my son was lost, but he has returned, and I am happy. Now the elder son, who had been out in the fields all day, and drawing close to the house at dusk, he was puzzled to hear the sounds of music and laughter. Passing one of the servants, he inquired what it was all about, and the servant replied, Your father has ordered a celebration for the safe return of your brother. This made the elder son so angry that he would not go into the house. And when his father came out to see why, the son said, over the years, I have served you faithfully, and you know you can rely upon me. You, yet you have never even put on a feast of goat meat for me and my friends. Now this prodigal comes running back because he has squandered everything on harlots and gambling, and you immediately have a great feast of celebration. The father said, My son, you are my right-hand man, and I know you have never let me down. I depend upon you, and all I have is yours. But this is a special occasion, for the one I thought was lost to me has returned. This does not lessen my affection and regard for you, but he is weak and needs support, while you are strong and do not require such displays of affection. Yahushua put his arms around two disciples and said, My friends, when the going gets tough and the road is long, some collapse by the wayside. If it is these who need encouragement, and it is not always easy to admit failure, when a sheep becomes separated from a flock and is lost among the thorn bushes, does not a good shepherd leave the rest and go in search of the one which has gone astray? This does not mean he loves it more than the others, nor does, he less, nor does it lessen the, his love for each of them. So we've heard the story of the prodigal son, but it was kind of random when he talks about it in the Gospels. This makes a lot more sense. Yeah. He had a disciple named Barnabas, which it could be, I don't know, I don't know if it's Paul's buddy, but there's another Barnabas that uh, he, showed, he, he was with Yehoshua and he left, he walked away from like a prodigal son. Then he came back, and Yehoshua gave him the story because two of the other people were upset when they came back from their little mission trip that uh, they didn't get like all, all happy that they came back because Barnabas had completely left Yehoshua, and they, they came back from their thing like they were supposed to do. But Barnabas wasn't supposed to return, but he did return. Yeah, and, and there, that's, that's the story, right? And a lot of this stuff now, it makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm sure there's other places where this um, supplies. It works, you know, something of the sort, but this was definitely this one. Okay, 61. It was some days later, at another place, that a follower named Yosef said to Yahushua, Master, if a man cheat another, is he punished for the cheating or for the harm he has done to the other man? Yahushua said, Speak of punishment only to the people, for this accords with their understanding. 
On Earth, men's deeds are weighed on scales balanced between reward and punishment. But these work inaccurately. In the kingdom of the Ruhak, the measurement of assessment is a man's earthly life. You are now on the balances. Do not be found wanting. Hard words right here. Right? Um, Kate, you make anything of this? Uh, we, we are going to be judged by our earth life, how we, how we live our life. It will be judged. It will be judged. We weighed against the Torah. Did you live correctly? Did you live worldly? Yeah, and it, Messiah clearly says men's deeds are weighed on scales on earth, right? Like you did good here, you did good there. But it looks to be that the assessment of a man's um, life in the kingdom is based upon his entire life, right? Is your, what is your, is your life worthy of this? And he leaves with, with something that everyone should understand is you are now on the balances. Do not be found wanting. Right? If, if things aren't balanced out, if things aren't right, it's not going to go well for us. 63. And I guess, before I go into 63, I guess that's a good thing. Because um, a lot of us do a lot of really bad things in our lives. And we, uh, <laughs> if we were judged specifically for those one things and the entire uh, accounting, our, our entire accounting was based upon a couple of really bad mess ups that we did, then we'd be doomed. We'd be completely doomed. And so Messiah says that we are... Um, judged a lot differently based upon the entire morsel. Okay, for glory is the garment with which each one who comes to the kingdom of heaven will be clothed. And each one who comes will be given a tire and station according to the credentials established on earth. These and many other things were taught to the disciples by Yahushua, but only one recorded them. Okay. So we basically put clothes based on how good we were. Yeah. Um... Yeah, and so uh, the garment with which the, each one comes to the kingdom of heaven will be clothed in, and each one who comes will be given a tire and station according to the credentials established on earth. So, yeah, our dress attire, what we look like in the kingdom to come, is going to be based up on this. And so um, hopefully it's not a big deal because I like going around in shorts. Hopefully I'm not having to get like a big tuxedo, this big heavy duty or something of the sort. If I even make the kingdom, I'll probably get tossed into the worms in the, the other pile and just sit there and burn. But for those of you who do make the kingdom, you're going to get a nice set of clothes, hopefully. Um, but it's based upon the actions of our life right now, guys. So let's keep this life that we have in balance. Let's do what Messiah says, and let's make sure that we make this kingdom road. All right, everybody. Thank you guys very much. Have a wonderful day. All right. Shalom.